I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from FinancialJuneteenth.com. Uh, I wanted to uh, do a, just sort of a quick intro to this uh, interview I'm about to do with Mr. Tracy Cfax. Um, the video got chopped up, and so you kind of jump in after Tracy begins talking. But I wanted to kind of let you know what was going on here, so you didn't think something strange was happening. Uh, basically, Tracy is the author of the book From the Block to the Boardroom, uh, which I hope you'll go check out uh, at his website, from the block to the boardroom.com with the number two. And uh, the reason I'm excited to talk to Tracy is because Tracy is uh, an ex-offender. He did a few years in prison for drug distribution, um, and also I think he had a gun charge as well. But uh, he got out in 93, and since that time, he has done amazing and phenomenal things. Uh, he has been honored by the White House. He has created some multi-million dollar businesses and he's really done what I want uh, every person every young black person uh, and all of us are young black people the way I see it is if you're under the age of 75 you're a young black person uh, what I want every young black person in America to do is to commit ourselves to the idea of owning our own businesses our own stuff uh, you know the fact is that it's very difficult to become wealthy in America without owning something it's very difficult to overcome oppression in America without owning something because if you don't own something then there's a good chance somebody owns you so check out this interview listen to this brother's wisdom it's a long interview but I hope that you'll 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 pay close attention to what he has to say uh, because um, He's one of the soldiers that's, that's on the front lines in terms of fighting for the things that, that you and I believe in. So uh, without further ado, I give you Mr. Tracy C. Facts. In order to support my habit, you know, it's been times where I used to stay up for three, four days in a row and, and make uh, two or three trips to New York back and forth from New Jersey, you know, all chasing that, you know, chasing that drug and, and chasing that high. So, you know, now that I'm clean and sober, you know, in the world of business and as an entrepreneur, you know, I use that same philosophy. I don't, you know, listen, I, I, I go hard for, for what I believe in and I go hard um, as an entrepreneur in order to be successful. So I think a lot of those same qualities um, that I possess as someone that was trapped off in the street, I possess those same qualities now. You know, I just use it in a positive way. Mm. Well, you know, I really like what you said, and and you know, um, uh, you know, just starting, go, you know, I guess starting back with with what we talked about as far as you know, working every day and doing what you have to do when you have to do it to get what you want. Um, you know, I I think that first lesson is important, and then what I like what you just said is, you know, this idea that uh, that these these talents that you apply in one area of your life. They can also be be applicable in multiple areas of your life. They can help you to achieve lots of things in lots of different ways. Um, <clears throat> now, you, uh, you you did you did your time for drugs, which I don't think is anything to be ashamed of, because as you know, there's a huge fight to deal with uh, the effects of mass incarceration as it relates to uh, you know simple types of drug distribution and possession. Uh, you know, we know in our many of our communities they remove the uh, the schools and the jobs and replace them with drugs and weapons. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's any uh, shame in that at all. I think that uh, it sounds to me like you have taken that and you, you're applying um, what you learned from your previous trade to what you do now. Can you give me mm -hmm. some examples of how, uh, you know, some things you learned in the street, if you will, uh, really helped you to excel as a businessman? Um, you know, that's a good question, too, Doc. Um you know, I, I look at and, and I and I speak all the time to in, in different prisons and halfway houses and drug rehab. I'm actually going to be um, um, speaking on um, September 11 at Trenton State Prison um, to the inmate population there. They have a um, NAACP branch in the prison, um, so they have their annual gala. So I will be doing the um, keynote speech for them um, next week. But I say that to say that when I'm speaking to that audience. You know, I talk about some of the great attributes of an entrepreneur, one who um, that have um, that has sold drugs and, and have been in the streets. Is that, you know, you have to have ability to take risks. You know, if you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur, you can't be afraid to take risks. Um, and I've taken risks all my life, standing on that corner with that dynamite in my pocket. And I tell brothers all the time, you know, it takes a lot of heart to take a shotgun and run up in the liquor store. You know, it takes a lot of heart to do a lot of things that we do as criminals. Um, but that same heart that we that we use for criminology, we can also use in a positive way um, through entrepreneurship. So I, what I kind of do is take both of those things and, and, you know, being a drug dealer and, and someone who, 
who, who sold drugs. I know all about marketing. I know all about providing a good product. I know all who's my target um, customer base. All those things I knew, you know, as a drug dealer without attending um, Harvard School of Business, without attending any, you know, business courses. I knew those things as a um, as a drug dealer. So those same same quality that I possessed then, I, I, I still possess now. And then I use those same qualities to um, to be a successful business person. And one thing about I tell people all the time is that, you know, I probably met more crook crooks in 20 years I've been in business in a boardroom than I ever met in the streets. <laughs> so I get an opportunity, um, you know, to see game coming a mile away. You know, when you could become successful and, um, you know, people recognize you. And I live in a 7.5 7 square mile um, town called Trent, New Jersey, which is the capital. Of New Jersey, but you know a lot of people know me, so you get a lot of folks that come to you with you know grandiose ideas, and some of them are are, are truthful, and some of them is game. Um, I've been able to recognize game, whether it's in the streets or whether it's in, in the boardroom. I recognize it coming a mile away. So all those attributes and all those qualities that I possess as one who has um, spent you know over a decade in the streets, um, I still possess those same qualities now, and it only just helps me. Um, to be a successful entrepreneur today. Well, you know, and, and I, like, I like how you uh, explain how um, you know you, you've met as many uh, quote unquote crooks in the boardroom as you did, you know, on the block. Um, and I and I think that's important, right? Because we have a society where we we kind of have this this very uh, arbitrary line that that we use to decide, okay, who, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. But if you look at a lot mm-hmm. of the most prominent politicians, most successful business people in America, the wealthiest people in America, uh, you find a whole lot of dirt in their background. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, where, where some of them, I even know some prominent politicians who've had people killed. You know, and mm-hmm. you know, and and then you know, it's it's interesting too. Uh, you know, uh, another, in fact, another example I'm thinking about is how just a few years ago you had a lot of guys. You still got guys at, at places like Rikers Island uh, for possessing marijuana. But now you mm-hmm. got you got white guys in Colorado becoming millionaires selling marijuana, right? Selling, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and 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 the last point I'll make on that, and then I'll, I'll let you talk because this is this is your interview. Now, I'm, but you got me excited, man, because you got me you got me <laughs> here. Uh, you you are so correct when when you think about uh, you know, now. For the sake of full disclosure, I've never been a drug dealer. Uh, I can't say I've had drug dealers in my family, but uh, but I have not done that. However, uh, when I think about a, a typical business school, uh, and you parallel that with, uh, with you know what people learn in business school with what uh, a brother has to learn on the block, you know uh, whether, mm-hmm. whether, whether he's selling whether he's selling crack or donuts, it, it really doesn't matter what you're mm-hmm. selling. It, the process mm-hmm. is the same. You you got to mm-hmm. deal you got to deal with distribution of your product. You got to deal with mm-hmm. business management, managing your employees. Mm-hmm. You got to deal with accounting, keeping up with the money you make. You got to deal yeah. with with marketing, uh, you and branding. You got to deal with entrepreneurship. You know, expanding into new territories, mm-hmm. things like that. Understanding the risks mm-hmm. and the trade offs. So uh, you're right. I mean, it, it almost seems to me that the uh, that, that there's a perfect business school education that's actually superior. To what you learn in, in many universities, because uh, I, I had this conversation with my daughter last night. She's a business major, and I said, "Sweetie, I said, what you learn in that book has very little connection to the real world. <laughs> you need to understand that. You know, the theory is good. You know, we I think yes, people should yes, go to college yes. again, but but you get in that real world and you're really doing it. There's real money on the line, real people being dealt with. It's mm-hmm. a whole different ball game. So let me ask you this: so so how, uh, when you go to universities, do you get chances to speak in business schools and stuff like that? And if so, how does that go? Well, um, you know, I had an opportunity in um, 2011. Um, I was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year um, by the Princeton Chamber of Commerce. I'm from Trenton, New Jersey. Um, Princeton is about maybe 10 or 15 minutes outside of um, of Trenton, but I was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year by that chamber and actually was the first African-American um, in the 51-year history of that chamber's assistance to ever win that award. Um, so making history then, and then I got the, the opportunity um, to speak to their young um, entrepreneurs. They call it the young business class of entrepreneurs they have in the chamber. So it wasn't actually a, a university or college, but to get an opportunity to speak to, I think it was approximately 38 young entrepreneurs um, from Princeton um, on my experiences as, as an entrepreneur and, and some of the things that I have done in order to be successful today, 
um, you know, I think, you know, really, really speaks to what you just said about how you can learn certain things um, in a classroom and you can learn certain things out of a book. Um, but learning hands-on experiences, and I tell people all the time, I paid a high tuition doc for my college education. I don't have a degree. I, I don't have a Ph.D., but I paid a, a price um, for the knowledge and the things that I've learned over the years to, to get to where I am today um, that a lot of people just, you know, that are in my position that have not, have not had the opportunity to do that. So, you know, not being able to attend a college, not being able to attend a university, um, I still believe that I have uh, um, the wherewithal and the knowledge um, to be successful in business um, just by my background. Well, you know, I agree with you 100%. You know, um, I think that particularly when you talk about the fact that so many uh, so many of us uh, have been affected by the incarceration problem in the United States, um, and I think it's, it's, it's their problem, not our problem. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you see a lot of people that um, have been able to really take that experience and use that as an opportunity to um, to make themselves who they want to be educationally. And we, we have to realize that education is not just something you get from a university. You can get uh -huh. it anywhere. Anywhere there's a book, uh, anywhere there's a computer with Internet access, you can make yourself into a bachelor's degree uh, level person. You can make yourself into uh -huh. a master's candidate or a Ph.D. if you want on that topic. Uh, two good examples I know of, and, and these are brothers I, I, uh, you may want to look up, man. Um, very good, good friends of mine. One is uh, Daryl Pageant. Daryl did, uh, he was sentenced to 40 years for possession of one gram of crack cocaine. Wow. And uh, he did 20 of those years. And while he was um, incarcerated, he studied the law so extensively that he was able to file the legal documents to, to secure his own early release when President Obama mm. changed the law. Another one is Yorima Karama, who did, uh, he did 20 years as well uh, for, for, I think, a drug and gun sort of situation. And, um, you know, he said, when I got there, he said, I spent three years being mad about where I was, but I spent the rest of the time saying, I'm going to turn this place into my own university. And I can, mm. and I can say that you know and and I'm, I'm I guess I'm relatively well educated, but I can say that you know I know another scholar when I talk to one. When I talk to you, I know I'm talking to an educated person. When I talk to Yurima mm. and Daryl, I know I'm talking to fellow scholars. You know, and I think that that's an important thing for all of us to understand that uh, sometimes you are better off getting your education outside of the system than you are mm. getting it within the system. Uh, do you agree? What mm. do you think about that? Oh, no, I think that's great, man. I, you know, Doc, that, because I think also what that gives you, that gives you that conscience, that black conscience, um, to say that it's not just about being successful, it's not just about being educated, it's also about what you can do for your um, fellow fellow brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, I've learned that in my 20 years that I've been, been in business, I think because of where I've come from and how I arrived at to where I am today, it gives me that, that, that black conscience that says, it's not enough for me just to be successful. It's not enough for me to to own you know million dollar businesses, and not do what I can um, for the millions of um, ex offenders that are coming home from prison every day, um, that are trying to reintegrate them, themselves back into society. So, um, you know that's what my type of education has given me. Um, you know the fact that I was honored at the White House a couple of months ago. You know, I was honored at the White House for my work that I do in the field of reentry. Um, you know, here in New Jersey, we worked very, very hard over the past four or five years um, to implement Ban the Box, uh, which in New Jersey is called the Opportunity to Compete Act. And we had that pass our Senate um, last month. And I think it was only one senator that voted against it. And I don't, I don't know what was on his mind, but the fact of the matter that it passed overwhelmingly here in New Jersey. Um, it went to the governor about three weeks ago. Um, nobody knew whether Governor Christie was going to sign it or not. Um, um, but, you know, last week he signed it, and he signed it into law. So New Jersey now has, you know, the ban the box law. And, and one, of the, one of the reporters that asked me, he said, well, you know, how do you feel about this? And um, do you really accept this as a great victory on behalf of those that are coming home from prison? I said, I do, you know, it's, it's definitely a step forward. But the fact of the matter is that when we wake up and when I wake up tomorrow, I look to pick my next fight. Um, this is never over. We have to continue. There are 45,000, I believe it, 45,000 collateral damages um, that affect ex-offenders coming home from prison. 
um, on a daily basis. And, and those collateral damages ranges from anything from um, being denied housing, being denied unemployment, um, being able to, um, you know, work in certain fields. Um, and it's all by design. And this is after you've completed your sentence, after you've completed parole, and that you're a free man who has paid this debt to society, all these collateral um, consequences are still affecting you from really, really um, uh, reintegrating back into society and changing your life. And we um, are so-called a Christian nation. You know, in the Bible it talks about, you know, redemption and, and, and second chances and, and, and all those things, but we have yet to really embrace that as a nation. So, you know, I really am excited at the same time about where we are um, in this fight because, um, you know, as you know, the Attorney General Holder has been very, very strong advocate for revamping some of the drug laws because it doesn't make no sense. Just like the brother you just talked about, a 40-year a forty year sentence for a drug possession charge and to spend 20 years in prison, you know, and I say this all the time, especially for a nonviolent, you know, offender, you know, someone who, who's who maybe have had a drug problem, that sold drugs, you know, we have to do all that we can to reintegrate them back into society. And I think a lot of the states um, are starting to realize that now. When your education, I mean, when your prison budget outweighs your education budget, you know, that's a problem. You know, when it outweighs your trans transportation budget, that is a problem. And here in the state of New Jersey, it costs us anywhere between forty-eight dollars to $52,000 per year to house a nonviolent offender, which is ridiculous. And if that person just happened to have diabetes or high blood pressure or any other medical illness, that, that number jumps up to seventy, eighty, and ninety thousand dollars a year. Um, so, you know, that doesn't make any sense when you can um, some kind of way get this person a job, some kind of way get them some type of training that will bring them to being a um, productive tax paying citizen here in the state of New Jersey. And I think that should be the goal, not just here in the state of New Jersey, but should be the goal throughout America. You know, as we look to, you know, tighten our belts on our budgets, you know, those are some of the things that we can look at in order to help us get there. And I really believe that we have a great opportunity now uh, with the president and, and with Attorney General Holder to really make some um, strides in this area. And I, and I just want to say this last thing here, Doc. When I was at the White House last month, um, a representative from John Hopkins Hospital was there, and they're going to come out with a report. It should be out now, um, where that they've hired in the past 10 years, they've hired, I think that number was around, if I'm not mistaken, around 12 or 13,000 people with, um, with records. And, uh, and, and in those past 10 years, they have never had an incident uh, with those people that they've hired. So they're going to come out with a report stating that. So, you know, some of the myths that we have that, that you know, you know, as you know, in that application, you check that box and your application goes in that pile over here, which usually means a pile of don't hire. Um, never, ever getting the opportunity to redeem themselves. Never, ever getting the opportunity to be renegraded back in society. And then they end up going right back to doing the same thing that they've always done, creating havoc and, and, and destruction in our communities. Um, so, you know, I, I really believe that we're at a great point in our history right now um, to really have our lunch counter moment um, as a generation. You know, they did it for us in the 60s, 40, 50 years from now, people are going to ask, what did we do? And I think um, being at the forefront of this issue, Michelle Alejandra um, lays it out eloquently in the book, um, The New Jim Crow, how we must create a social movement and a movement um, to address this issue in our community because it's, it affects our families. You know, folks ask all the time, where are all the men? Well, they're in jail. Let me tell you where they all are. Um, and we have to find a way to reintegrate them back in society so they can be made whole again, especially after paying your debt to society. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with you. And, and, and first of all, my, my, you know, one of my theories on this is that I really believe that there are people who have a vested interest in not wanting certain people mm -hmm. to come home. You know, I think that they, they really do. We've gotten to the point where we've become so sick that as a society that we actually want people in prison. Not we, meaning I'm talking about the society at large, wants people to be incarcerated 
uh, because that's where they get that cheap labor. Uh, that's how they get rid mm-hmm. of, of young black men, especially uneducated young black men that don't have a role mm-hmm. in the economy. And I think that's mm-hmm. something that as a community, we have to fight against that. We have to fight this mm-hmm. with everything we've got because uh, mm-hmm. our, our future's on the line. Uh, you know, the other thought that I had, uh, you know, based on what you were, were saying is, um, um, you know, when you talk about prisoners' rights, uh, one thing I found is that there is so much resistance to people even caring about prisoners' rights because everybody thinks it affects somebody else, you know, and the only mm-hmm. time they become in touch with it is when it affects a loved one or it affects them, then suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, this is such a, an injustice. It reminds me, it makes me think about the Michael Brown situation where I saw a lot of people that were very uh, active in what happened in Ferguson with Michael Brown, and I was telling them, I said, well, wait a minute, a month ago when I was trying to get you to join uh, Cornell West and, and, and Michelle Alexander and others in, in the month of resistance against Uh, police brutality and mass incarceration that's going to occur in october you weren't interested in that now suddenly Mm. you you know now suddenly you're on the phone with me trying to tell me about all the problems that are going on in the black community but i'm like i brought this up to you 20 times and you didn't want to hear it you know and i and i think that it's um you know so i think it's unfortunate that uh you know that, that we still have to work to educate people to understand that that you know inmates that we have to support and protect those rights. We cannot have a mindset that says, because here's what the mindset is, I believe. The mindset is that, that justifies this lifelong sentence, even when you paid your debt to society. The justification mm-hmm. in people's minds, I think, is you committed a crime, you're a bad person, so you deserve mm-hmm. you deserve whatever you get. So that mm-hmm. means that if you go to prison and somebody kills you, you deserve it because you shouldn't you shouldn't have stole those cookies or whatever it was you did to go to prison, right? If mm-hmm. you, if you can never get a job for life, well, you shouldn't you know if you hadn't stolen those cookies, this wouldn't happen to you. And people have mm-hmm. to understand the punishment has to fit the crime. You don't give somebody right. you know uh, you know I have a very good friend whose father got 14 life sentences for a nonviolent first time offense oh. in the drug possession chart, and I'm like. What kind of sick society do we live in? You know, so so I think that's what people uh, have to understand is that we're looking for humanity and equity. We're not looking for, we're not looking for a world where people can go and and commit horrible crimes and not pay a price for that. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're just looking for a world where there's fairness, and it seems that that's that's, right. that's what what you're saying too. Am I right? Mm-hmm. No, no, I think you're correct, Doc. And, and listen, as someone who has came from there, who has came through the prison system. Um, that still wears a number, um, 226926. That's my old prison number. If I was to ever commit a crime, I'll go back to jail. I'll still have that same number. Um, I put that number on the side of my book when I released it. Um, the fact of the matter that I'll be the first to say, Doc, that listen, there are some people that, 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 that are in our community that deserve to be locked up. And that deserve to be locked up for a very long time. That's just a fact. But the fact of the matter is that there are also a lot of nonviolent offenders that do not deserve to spend two life sentences in jail for a simple drug possession. I mean, like you said, where's the, where's the equity in sentencing here um, where that something like that would happen? And um, one of the real things that, that really drove me to really, really um, uh, uh, be a strong advocate on, on, on behalf of ex-offenders is the fact that matters that, you know, I had a cousin that went down when I went down in 1988. Um, drug possession. He was a drug dealer, same as I, I was. You know, I, I went down. Um, I got sentenced in '88. I went down in '89. He went down around the beginning of '88. Um, I came home in '93. Uh, um, he just came home two years ago. You know, after spending over 20 something years in prison for a nonviolent drug offense, only, Doc, only to die of cancer six months later. You know what I mean? So those are the type of things right there. And I, I've watched the hurt on my aunt's face, you know, because she fought for a number of years to get him out of jail, man, for a long time to get him out of jail. And then when she finally got him out, um, you know, finally got him out of jail after spending 23 years in prison, you know, for him to die of cancer six months later, she was taking him to the doctor and, and brought him back home and she was ready to get him out of the car. And when she went around to get him out of the car, he was in the passenger seat dead. Um, and I can only imagine, and, and my cousin Andrew was such a smart man. Oh, man, he, when you talk about intelligence, brother, this brother had it. And, and same thing, um, ran a large amount of drugs, you know, enterprise, a lot of workers and stuff like that. But he was very compassionate, brother, very intelligent, brother. You know, and, and I could tell, I, I'll be the first to admit that he was light years ahead of me um, on the intelligence side. But 
you know, when I look at his situation and look at where I am today and only think about where he could be um, today, it just, it just really is just a waste, man. It's just 23 years is just wasted talent, um, you know, just spent in prison when this guy could have been so much for our community and not just for our community, but for the world. Well, you know, I, I love that. I, 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 first of all, that, that story is tragic and it definitely breaks my heart. But I love the fact that you are telling that story. I love the fact that you're, you're carrying uh, this great man's legacy with you in the great things that you're doing. And I think that we have to be honest and understand that, that what we've gone through with the war on drugs and mass incarceration, that's a holocaust in terms of what it's, mm-hmm. done, what it's done to our families. That is a holocaust. And... Mm-hmm. You know the obligation on Holocaust survivors like like yourself, like me. Uh, you know, because I had incarceration affect so many people in my family, I just was able to avoid that. I think the bur- the 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 burden or the challenge or the expectation for people like us is we have to carry that banner for mm-hmm. our, our lost loved ones. You know, with my older mm-hmm. brother, you know, my older brother, my I told you my my primary role model went to uh, prison. Well, he, he he was actually my uncle, but he was like a brother. We were close in age. Uh, when he died two years ago, after having spent time in and out of jail, and I saw how prison changed him at the age of 19, 20, 21 years old. He wasn't right after he went to prison. You know, mm-hmm. he spent 30 years homeless uh, in all the kinds of horrible situations. And then he eventually just, he, you know, he died in, 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 in very tragic circumstances. I won't go into that. But uh, mm-hmm. I know one thing that helps me heal from that is I carry him with me. When I'm talking mm-hmm. to young men, I'm, I'm, I'm carrying that, that spirit. And it, it, it pushes you, you know, and, 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 and I'll say this last thing and then I'll, I'll let you get back to your day because I've taken so much of your time. Um, you know, I, I think the other interesting thing is that um, it's really up to those of us who've been close enough to the system to understand it, to be the ones to advocate for those inmates. Because when when inmates are advocating for themselves, for some reason, society just doesn't listen. You know, when, when right. the inmates go on strike, uh, some people mm-hmm. are sympathetic. A lot of people don't care. But when those Uh of us who are on the outside, those of us who've who've been there and get a chance to do great things like you, those of us who have loved ones who've been affected, uh, we have to really carry that 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 torch for them and make sure Uh that that we make this an important issue in our society, Uh that we don't let our society move forward without dealing with those of us who are being crushed by this oppression. Uh, Uh So so that that's that's my thought on, on what you just said, man. I'm so sorry about your cousin. Uh, now I'm, I'll let you ask. Uh, I'll give give you the last question. And I'll let you uh, get back to your day, man. I appreciate your time so much. Um, okay, so you said you, you you wake up every day and you're looking for your next fight. And I, I like that. I respect a fighter. So, what are you? Uh, what's your next fight? Well, um, you know, mass incarceration is such a big fight, and I, and like I said, I've dedicated dedicated my um, my career and my life um, um, to that fight. Um, so I think, you know, continue to, to continue to spread that message. I, I remember when we screened elementary genocide, I'm the chairman of the board of trustees at my church here in Trent, New Jersey. And um, we screened elementary genocide at my church. And um, I got an opportunity to get up in the pulpit and ask the congregation, you know, how many people in here by a show of hands are, are some kind of way affected by the criminal justice system, meaning whether it's a cousin, mother, brother, friend, uncle, you know, distant, long-time childhood, high school, I bet, all, I bet all the hands went up. Uh, you know, no, well, you know, only about maybe 60, maybe 60% of the people raised their hand until I had to remind them that it's Sunday and we're in church. <laughs> and then after that, you know, about 93% raised their hand. And, 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 and it goes to show you that a couple of things. Number one, you know, the stigma that is attached to that, a lot of us in our community, we don't want to talk about that and we don't want to discuss that. Um, and then number two, we have to have, be honest about it. Um, the fact of the matter is that, you know, these are our brothers and sisters, whether we're relatives or not, these are our brothers and sisters that are trapped into a system that is basically set up to, to chew them up and spit them out with never, ever getting the opportunity um, to reclaim their lives never get an opportunity for redemption, um, and just never get an opportunity to be made whole again, you know, after you've completed your sentence. You know, my office, Doc, is located on Martin Luther King Boulevard in Trenton, New Jersey. I've been there about maybe 14 years. 
Um, just like every other Martin Luther King Boulevard throughout America, one of the most challenged areas of our city. Um, and being that I was in jail, I still have a state number. A lot of people come home from prison, um, come to my office to see me. And I've had grown men, Doc, grown men who have spent years in prison um, sit in a chair and just break down in tears, um, telling me that they can't go. They, they looked all over. And they just cannot find a job or nobody that will give them that chance. They trace it. Listen, I will sweep up the floor. I will pick up the trash. I'll do whatever I have to do not to be able to go back to prison. I got a son. I got a daughter. And I just need an opportunity, man. I've heard this story so many times in my 20 years of being in business that it's just so heartbreaking um, that I know that if given a chance, there are some good people out there that really, really, um, want to do the right thing, and they're just looking for that opportunity, man. And, and like I said, and, and and you know, us as a Christian nation, we have to be receptive to that. We have to be able to say, okay, you've done your time, you successfully completed parole. Now you're just looking for an opportunity to work, um, and, and to be with your family, and, and and we need to be able to provide that opportunity. So one of the things that I do. And one of the fights that I continue to fight on is that I connect entrepreneurship with ex-offenders returning home from jail. I attended the Million Man March in 1995, October 1995. And one of the messages Minister Farrakhan said was that if you didn't have a job, your charge was to go back to your community and create one. And even though I, wasn't, I was working then, I had a, a job. I was actually had a good job. I was making $35 an hour at the job that I was at, but the same job that I was at, I was only one African-American out of, uh, of, of 38 employees that worked there. And my brother-in-law had actually worked there for a little while, and he had got laid off, and he was an ex-offender also. So when he got laid off, you know, it kind of, you know, it hurt me, and, and the fact of the matter is that I knew he was going to have a hard time finding a job in which he was going through those situations. So when I attended the Main Man March and Mr. Farrakhan said those words, I came back and started my first company three months after that, and it was my construction company. And I did that um, even though I was still working, but I did that because I wanted to give my brother-in-law the opportunity to work, and which I did. He, he worked with me for a number of years once we got it started. And, and then over the years, um, you know, at the height of the um, America's economy when everything was good, you know, I had over 18 employees. And out of those 18 employees, 11 of them, 11 of them was ex-offenders. So being able to teach entrepreneurship skills to those returning citizens that are coming home from prison does a couple of things. It, it not only gives them an opportunity to be successful in business, but I know if they're successful in business, they're going to do what? They're going to hire other brothers and hire other sisters and give them the opportunity um, to, to, to make a living, um, to provide for their family. So, you know, those are some of the things that, that, that I continue to be involved in now, and I try to make those connections in any way that I can. I was just up in New York um, two weeks ago. If you get the opportunity, you can look this company up. It's called, uh, well, it's a nonprofit. It's called Devi Ventures, D-E-F-Y Ventures, um, out of New York. Started about maybe four or five years ago. Um, a bunch of venture capitalists, millionaires with money that donate to that organization. Um, and they help start up businesses anywhere from, um, and they give them the seed money to get started, anywhere from five to 10000 up to $150,000 to start a business. But one of the criteria is, is what? You have to be an ex-offender. You have to be an ex-offender. You have to be someone who has sold drugs, either a, a gang leader or something like that, in order for you to get into this program. So even the venture capitalists here in America are realizing, you know, the qualities um, that ex-offenders possess. You know, those who have went through that life and those who have been there and have done those things um, they possess those qualities that's needed to be successful business owners. So they realize that. I realize that. And we just got to get a whole country and a community to start to realize that. These are not just throwaways that we're talking about. These are not people that are, 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 can't, that are, that are some kind of way infected for the rest of their lives to never, ever be um, made whole again and never, ever be successful again. These are human beings who are just looking for the opportunity um, to have a second chance and sometimes a third chance. And we as a nation need to be able to provide that for them. So I'm going to do my part um, wherever I can and, and work with people like you and Raheem Shabazz and, and other people that I work. Um, um, I've done some things with Senator Booker also, but other people that I work in that area 
you know, to try to really, really um, make a difference. I tell people all the time, and I'll end with this, you know, I have a profession. Um, my profession is construction and real estate. That's, that's how I make my living. That's my uh, profession. I have a passion, and my passion is in reentry and reducing mass incarceration as we know it today. And, um, you know, I love my passion. I love what I do. Uh, so I'm going to continue to, to really work hard in that area, probably just as hard as I work in my profession, um, because that what makes me feel good. That is what um, keeps me going, um, to be able to see the faces of those folks that are given that opportunity um, to not go back to jail, man. It's, it's just such an important issue. And, and one last thing, that I, I um, um, for two years, I was co-chairman of a, of a board here in Trenton, New Jersey, called the Moet Board. And the Moet Board was the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training. And um, that was specifically set up here in Trenton, New Jersey, to help ex-offenders get jobs. And we had about 48 businesses and corporations that agreed to hire ex-offenders. Uh, we'll, we'll screen them. You tell us what you want. We'll screen them, and we'll send them to you. And they agreed to... Um, to hire people with criminal background records, but we used to do a graduation every three months of our folks that we had successfully um, got full-time jobs and part-time jobs for. And I'm telling you, man, I, you know, to see the faces, and we used to invite the family and they chosen to come to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the celebration and everything, but to see the faces on these ex-offenders with their children, with their significant other, um, happy, um, doing the right thing, um, some of the employees getting up there saying, listen, uh, uh, brother, brother Jack here or brother Raheem here, you know, is one of my best employees. He's at the office before I am opening up the doors because we gave him an opportunity and um, he took fully advantage of it. So, you know, those are the things that drive me, man. And I know that if we can make that happen, we can not only heal our community, we can at the same time reduce crime in our community. Um, so it's very important, man. Well, you know, I agree. I agree. It's so important. And I love what you said about entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, people are not giving black men jobs the way they should be. And uh, and Malcolm always said anyway that you really don't want to go begging your enemy for a job. Not not to say that every white man is our enemy, but white America and institutionalized racism uh, sometimes uh, put themselves in the position of oppressor. Let's just say that. Uh, well, I want to say thank you, man. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, and I didn't get a chance to mention to everybody that you are that you are a, a one of the stars in, in the great film Elementary Genocide, made by Raheem Shabazz. Uh, I'm in that film. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, a lot of other great people. Um, Supreme Understanding, the poet, just a uh, killer, Mike. So many people did a great job, really talking about some key issues. And and uh, Raheem is also. Um, uh, an ex-offender who is doing amazing things, and uh, and so I'm so excited about. I was I was excited about being a part of the project. I think the film is doing extremely well, and people are enjoying it around the country. Uh, so everybody, uh, this is Mr. Tracy Cfax. He is the author of the book From the Block to the Boardroom. I wanted to make sure I say it right. And if you want to uh, support him, which I really hope that you will, uh, go to his website. The website is from the block to the boardroom dot com, and that's uh, the two is is with the number two. So from the block to the boardroom with the number two dot com. So go buy a copy of the book, even if you're not going to read it. Just go buy a copy because we got to support each other, and um, and also continue to follow. And uh, so, I, so thank you very much, brother. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate having. I hope, hope to see you soon. Absolutely, Mo most definitely. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Financial Juneteenth. And until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace. <laughs>